Hi, I'm Avalon Starlight, and you are listening to the Rebel Unicorns podcast. This season, we are diving deep into what being an empath in business actually looks like. Listen each week as I share tips and tricks to master your empath energy, as well as sharing incredible guests who have created successful businesses by claiming their empath title. Are you ready? Let's get our rebel on. All right, Rebel Unicorns, I'm very, very excited. Actually, today's guest was one of, well, in my first like couple years of doing business, you came into my life, Laura. But we actually met, which is fun, um, doing the vagina monologues. <laughs> if we're gonna be honest, <laughs> we were like casted to be in this play together. And then We got to work together, but the minute I laid eyes on this human, I knew she was destined for greatness. I knew she was gonna change the world. I knew that she had the power within her heart to smother this planet and to change its vibration in a big, bold, bad way. Like truly, like it makes me a little emotional to think about it because you have so much fucking love in you. And I'm so excited to have Laura Hughes as a guest today on the Rebel Unicorns podcast. And there is no better guest. Like I, when I messaged her to be, I was like, listen, what's the name of your handle on Instagram? (laughs) Self-care with Laura. (laughs) What is the new program you just put out? (laughs) The Take Really Good Care of Yourself project. (laughs) The Take Really Good Care of Yourself. And you're also promoting like a boundaries course, right? (laughs) All about boundaries, all about boundaries, yes. We cannot be empaths in business without boundaries for ourselves and for our clients. And which is so funny because the first week is all about that. Mm. Like that was the number one thing I had to say to people. Like, I'm like, if you are an empath, the one thing you have to have right away before we do protection, before we do anything else, you, none of it will matter. (laughs) Mm -hmm. Literally. Yep. If you don't have the boundaries in place. So my question for you is always, I like to start with, do you know what Rebel Unicorn House you are. Yes. I loved taking your quiz. Like I had the most fun with it. And there was moments where I really, you know what, it helped me really tune in like deeper into my gift and my medicine when I offer folks, because I'm like, Ooh, all these answers are so interesting. Okay. What's uniquely me focus in. So I am a cosmic rebel unicorn. And just before coming on here, I actually wrote down one of the things that really struck me in the description, which was that I support people to manifest, or I support, you know, the world and the universe by manifesting change one human at a time. And that really, like of all the things that were written there, I'm like, yep, that sounds like me. That sounds like me. That sounds like me. Whoa. Like that line felt really good to read. It felt very aligned. Right. We don't have to take it so bold and big and broad. And I think as empaths, that's like the most (laughs) overwhelming (laughs) sense. I can't carry more than one. Swear to good God. So what? <laughs> I've been doing that my whole life. No, <laughs> I know. So did you know you were an empath before we started working together? No, that it was maybe a word that had, you know, it had come up on the odd Instagram post. I think I was aware of the idea or the, I could maybe bring up a bit of a description in my head, but I, I don't think it was until we started working together that it really clicked of, oh, okay, I'm an empath. Th- this kind of brings some dots and experiences in my life together. And what was it like? Because I, one of the big conversations that I'm having is when, when you don't know you're an empath and are one, it's kind of like uncontrolled energy. You don't know when it's oh, like when you're feeling heavy or burdened or the minute you claim the name, all of a sudden it's like this like path opens up and you gain like almost like the authority mm. with it. So can you give a little bit of history of like what it was like prior? And then when you did find like figure it out and you were like, oh, 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 yeah, yeah, yeah. This is it. yeah, yeah. That, that's the thing. What was really. the difference between the two? Mm. When I think of, so before I really knew and was able to harness and like anchor in, like you're saying into the authority of, okay, oh, I'm an empath. Now what? Like, how can we then move forward? Before that, it was, I mean, I can look back now of patterns of just being depleted energetically constantly feeling like I could, you know, was picking up on everything that was happening with those around me was, you know, feeling so, so, so much 
to the point that I, I, I didn't understand what was happening. Like it was like, how, how, how am I just so full of feeling? And, you know, and I, I'm sure we'll get into this in other, you know, discussions too, but for me, I can look back now and look at patterns of people pleasing and codependency and playing the mediator role that, that all kind of intertwine with not being an empowered or an educated empath. And how I then was taking on these roles where I really did, wasn't in my authority. And what I really like about the word authority is that what it really means is author of your own story. So when you're in your authority, you're, it's your story. You are in kind of influence and control of your life. And yeah, before that, it was, you know, someone would call me for advice and I would spend four hours on the phone just holding space for them. And then I would just be done for a week and didn't know what happened. So, you know, yes, no boundaries you know, no sense of identity outside of just helping people. Because I think to own when you're an empath, it's also knowing who you are alongside those gifts and having more than solely how we serve and support others and that that doesn't overtake our lives. So that was certainly beforehand. And then once we started working together and once I really anchored in of what does it mean to be an empath? And oh, oh, okay, I, oh, this is me then I actually started working through those patterns, right? Then it became, oh, it can't just be a get out of jail free card. Oh, I'm an empath. Okay, we're done. <laughs> Which no shadow work needed. Like, let's just end there. Which I think it's easy to get caught up in. So it really, it was a mirror, like owning, okay, I'm an empath. And then I had to look at myself and start connecting within in order to then still serve and support outward and share that gift. It had to start within. That was the biggest change. I love that. I love that. And I think that we will talk about all the different um, ways that you implemented, you know, the part, the part that I love that you said, it was learning who you were beside being the empath. Like the empath was the, the bonus. It was the, like, you get Laura with a dash of empath on the side with like whipped cream. It's, it's like, additional greatness right and I think that for some listeners who haven't quite managed their the symptoms of being an empath because it's symptomatic right like the exhaustion the overwhelm like you said talking for four hours with somebody and then recovering for a week because we don't know how to flush Mm. emotions that aren't ours out of our body Mm -hmm. So when you started into the self-discovery of Laura beside the empath, what were the steps that you were taking? What types of shadow work or things were you doing in order to delve yourself in there? One of the like hardest questions I ever asked myself, and now I use it with every client I work with is like, what are 10 things about myself that have nothing to do with supporting others? So this was a journal prompt. I want to say August after that retreat, 2018, like it was around that time. And we'd done a lot of journaling at the retreat. And I kind of started this journaling practice and like, all right, Laura, like get to know you, like, who are you? And I went through a little bit of a, like, who am I? Oh my God. Right. There was really a, I have no idea because I think up until that point, I had not thought of myself as separate from who I was for others. So that journaling practice that, you know, was just a one day of, okay, so who am I? What are, what are 10 things about me? Write down some I am's now has become the go-to practice. So I had to write down and I get to three things. Okay. I'm creative. I'm adventurous. I'm athletic. Okay. I'm stuck. I'm kind. I'm helpful. I'm empathetic. I'm intuitive. And all the other things would come up, which are beautiful, wonderful qualities. But that became part of the first kind of element of my shadow work was starting to ask questions that little bit differently like taking your average self-help question and kind of turning it on its head and daily practices of what do I want to do for me? Mm -hmm. Which felt so selfish. It felt so selfish at first to think, what do I want to do today? Right? Well, and so it's interesting because I've decided that this week, the topic for being an empath is the self-care. Right. Right right? Like the, you have to take care of your energy first in order to actually manage supporting somebody else's energy. hundred percent. And so I'm excited because I kind of touched on this, this thing you're doing on Instagram right now, which I will put your Instagram handle in the 
comment so people can go back. Tell me about what started the self-care message that you've been doing for the last 30 days. Yeah, I realized that during the pandemic specifically, like, I mean, looking looking back, I'd probably been doing an intentional self-care journey for about four years. And then when I first got connected with you, it deepened a little bit more. And then when the pandemic hit, I realized that, and I think for many of us, many of my clients, old patterns, old habits were coming up because we're in this state of revealing, we're in this state of huge change. Um, so much is becoming clear to us. And I realized I wasn't taking as good care of myself as I had before, despite being much healthier and much more boundary and, you know, serving my clients so well, I was falling back into, you know, oh, I'll skip the journaling practice today, or I can, oh, okay, I'll just make a quick lunch. I won't take the 20 minutes to really make something I want to make. So that really deep self-care was suddenly getting kind of pushed aside. So I said, no, 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 we're not going back. Let's be intentional. So I started vlogging because I think people need to see how it's possible to self-care because we hear it everywhere, right? You can't scroll through Instagram without seeing the word self-care somewhere, but what does it actually mean to do it? So I put together this project, how to take really good care of yourself. And I take a minute video of me doing something each day that's for me. And some days it's taking myself on a date. Some days it is so much fun. I've loved it. It's been so much fun. Well, and why do you think that as an empath, the self-care piece is so instrumental? Mm. Bringing it back to boundaries, because I can't untether self-care boundaries and empathy. Like being an empath or having empathy without boundaries is self-harm, whereas empathy with boundaries is self-care. So the self-care becomes less about just the actions we're doing, but it's a way of being. So when we're taking really good care of ourselves, not only are we like building up energetically that we're worth it, that, you know, we are centered in ourselves. We're not selfless. We're not selfish. We're centered in ourselves. We know that we're worthy. Not only can we better serve our clients, but now our empathy can actually be a gift versus something that we carry around as, oh, I've got to recover from that because you're just, self-care is just a daily Self-care is our job as empaths, really. It has to be our job day in, day out. And you had mentioned that it was, it was challenging in the beginning. Like it was like, it was. <laughs> <laughs> I resisted it <laughs> so much. <laughs> so what kind of things would your ego tell you? Oh, oh, oh my gosh. Okay. So the ego voice would say, um, there's so many more things to do. Um, other people will judge you. Um, you're not being productive, rest is lazy. Um, who are you to think that you should relax and take care of yourself? Oh, this small action won't even make a difference. Don't even do it. Like, oh, the, the, just the ego of all the lies and, you know, those inner fears that come from the external, right. That become our internal voice of, Ooh, better not do that. And it, it really was a struggle. It took a solid, I would say year and a half to get into a groove where self-care then became the habit of you do it just as easily as you help someone else, right? Oh, I'll extend that help to a friend. I'll extend the help to myself. And it's hard to say exactly what shifted because it's not just a one day. I know some people have moments where they're like, this was the day and it all shifted. I think it was the accumulation of all the small choices that accumulated into a big shift that then just became the norm. Because I'm, I'm bringing this to the forefront too, because when I met you, you were working in a job that was draining the fuck out of you. Yep. <laughs> oh my gosh. I was working at first at a position that, you know, I had a master's degree and was like taking jobs that were <laughs> so low in pay. And okay, we could have a whole conversation about access and changes that need to happen in the workforce. But because I went in with Oh no, I'll just, I just need a starter job. No, I was in my late twenties with a master's degree, 10 years experience and was putting myself in positions where I was over giving at work, overextending myself, you know, working in a job that wasn't in alignment with how I could best serve and support others. And I was exhausted. Like I was depleted and really didn't think I deserved more. And I want to bring this up because I think that what I'm going to ask you is something that most people suffer from when, when we can sense or actually feel what somebody's going to feel before we've actually 
said what we're going to say, oftentimes it holds us back from even speaking our truth because we already can like, cause the thing about energy is that we can sense a response even before we say the thing. Yeah. Right. We know what the person's going to think or feel or experience, even as we're thinking the thought of telling them. And is this true? Cause I'm not sure if it's hundred percent true. So I'm asking you to confirm mm -hmm. that were you worried that you would let anyone down at your work if you quit? <laughs> oh gosh, yes, of course. I'll let down my colleagues. I'll let down the students I was supporting. My family will think I'm bonkers for trying to start a business. Um, and you know what? Some of those may have been true and some of them weren't. And I think this is where it gets complicated. So I think, you know, as empaths, we are going, we can pick up on that energy, pick up on that response before that person even says something. And I love this line from Brené Brown where she talks about what is the story you're telling yourself? Mm -hmm. I think it's, uh, you, we can't untether it because there's an element of, okay, I, I kind of know how this person's gonna respond. And there's been times that I've said, oh, I think I know what this person's gonna say. And it wasn't from being an empath in those moments. It was my fears and my ego projecting onto them. And only now I can see the difference, right? That there's definitely times where it's one, and other times where it's my own fears that I'm saying, oh my God, everyone's going to judge me. Mm -hmm. well, some people did, but a lot of people didn't, right? Or some people were confused or some people were this, but a lot of people were supportive. So it's interesting too, how we, to harness that gift of empathy is to also be able to really be in alignment with, am I in fear? And to use a lot of like what you've taught me of, here, are my chakras aligned right now? Or is my root chakra just like, Phew. And I'm worried about everyone's judgment, right? We have to know when one is happening and when the other is happening. Do you still think about the chakras? I do. Yay. I do. I know when my root chakra is off. Because I, I remember you teaching me around, you know, if you're worried about other people's opinions, you're in a place of fearing judgment. Like I just, I can sense. How many fair boundaries or you're people pleasing? Yep. You are. I will align it. That, was, that one's a big one. The root one is, is the one that I tend to love to focus on because it's the foundation of everything else, right? Yeah. We can't grow our service, our voice, our, or anything else without having the root kind of yeah. honed in, honed in. Mm -hmm. um, the other thing I want to ask is, did it ever occur? Cause I know this has happened to me and I'm just confirming that it might be thought when we think about leaving a situation. And so we're already thinking that people might judge or criticize or, but one of the things that was hard for me was that if I left, then they would have to take the burden. Like I was burdening them by leaving. They would have to, they're already tired. They're already overwhelmed. Now they're going to be stuck with all of my stuff and that feels harmful to them. Yeah. hundred percent. Yeah. There's that element of also because we intrinsically know what exhaustion and depletion, and we know that feeling so well, we wouldn't wish that upon another person. And this is where for me, I could see the elements too of some forms of people pleasing of the codependency coming up for me personally. And I'm not saying this is for everyone where it was over worrying about the burden placed on someone else. Um, and even outside of work examples of just any choice that I make for myself that someone else may disagree with or, oh, well, I really wish you'd do this or I was hoping you'd do that. You know, that's, that's now their lane to work in, right? But I think as, as empaths or anyone who kind of is, oh, am I an empath? Am I not? Or I think I am and I'm still working on boundaries. We over worry about someone else's experience. And what we do in those situations when we, we change our mind or we pull back on our, our boundary is we're taking away the, their dignity to navigate through their own lived experience. And when we can realize that it's actually giving them a gift to work through life and not always be that safe bed that we're trying to save people from those deep feelings. This is so powerful from the last episode that I, my solo episode talking about teaching people resiliency, like they have to learn their own resiliency, even if there are kids and even if there are partners, and even if there mm -hmm. are clients, like we cannot be responsible for their emotional states. Yeah. So, you know, the importance of the boundary for ourselves will, of course, people don't want fucking boundaries. It's not. <laughs> Right. Like they're going to want to take advantage of you. They're going to want to push you to a, like what, whatever they can get, they're going to take. Like, that's not a, like a bad thing. Like that's just human nature. Like we're just like, Oh, you you'll do that. And this, and this, 
right? Really? Okay. Are you going to stay on the phone with me right now? I am winning. I am winning. Yeah. <laughs> and so talk to me about your, your history with boundaries. Mm. And you know what, the example you just brought up from what I said before about the staying on the phone, I want to use that example to kind of show my history with boundaries. So, and I'm going to show it through what I was thinking, my internal voice during the time. So, you know, say four or five years ago that I was the person who would always be answering the phone. Yes, I'll be there. Oh, you're going through a tough time. I'll drop everything and be there. Even if it's a detriment to myself, my thought at the time was, oh, I'm just so exhausted. I wish my friends didn't need me so much but there was no sense of setting a boundary. It was almost in this almost victim, really victim mindset of, oh, well, I'm not taking any ownership over my part in it. So it was, I just wish they didn't need me so much. Then it was, oh, I just wish they wouldn't call me on weekends or after 8 p.m. So then I started saying, you know, I'm really not available on the weekends or could we chat next week? So I started to set a bit of a soft boundary that, you know, inevitably someone would push and I would just go along with it because I really wasn't empowered or confident in that boundary. And eventually it came down to, I'm not available to act as a therapist for my friends. And it really, and I mean, even saying that out loud, I worry, oh, are people going to think that's bad? It's not like we need to know our lane with our people and we can love our people so deeply and also be a detriment to their healing by taking on too much work. So my boundary setting started as, I mean, it's still uncomfortable. I set a boundary now and I've got to do a lot of energetic support and self-care for my system to just work through that boundary but it went from not even being aware that I had the right to set one and I think that's really important for people to reflect on is that before we can get to the stage of you know here's the beautiful sentence to say and here's how you set the boundary we've got to do that inner work around worthiness and again that identity do you believe it's your role to always be everything to everyone oh time to break that down before we can even work on what your boundary sounds like it's got to start at step one of knowing it's not our role to do everything. Yeah, that one's huge, <laughs> Laura. <laughs> like, and it's so interesting because I was telling a story in the last episode about, you know, cause Jeff and I have separated and, you know, we have, we don't have any boundaries set on what being a separated couple looks like. And we were navigating on our own before we saw we've got couples counseling coming up. And how for me now, boundaries give me the protection to play to the edges of my own emotions, Mm. right? Because without me knowing where I can expand my own emotional intelligence as an empath, because I can spread it to the fucking, you want some right now? I can give you some, <laughs> like, that's like I, can, I can share, I got all this <laughs> to give. <laughs> but when I know the boundary, then I feel safer. Mm-hmm. Yeah. So I've, I've just recently, like I was like, oh my God, last episode, I'm like boundaries equal safety for me. Yeah, cool. Right, and I think it's safety of, um, emotions not being distorted or, or there's like, it's, it's clean, right? I know how I can show up fully as my most centered, grounded, supportive self. And you know how you can show up and be serviced by me as my most supportive <laughs> guided self. And I think that's, that's significant. So I'm going to ask a, a kind of a personal question. Sure. What would you say is the experience obstacles or triggers that pull you out of your alignment with boundaries and self-care? What would be the things or people that still kind of hook you a little bit? Yeah, certainly for me, there's an element of when it comes, and this is, it's, it's, it's messy and connected, but I find for myself, and I've just moved out of this, moving out of this, I'll say that, I don't know if I'm going to be answering this correctly, but it was this, I I guess the piece of it for me was around, I would feel like I had to overgive to people who were in lines of work that I had previously been in. If I was working with, you know, frontline workers and there'd be this feeling of, you know, we don't want a mental health workshop because we don't have all these different things that they should be receiving through work. Because as we know, many workplaces don't provide mental health supports and adequate benefits packages. 
And I felt so guilty that I couldn't solve that problem. So that pulls me out a lot. And it's something I've, I'm working through and can feel some more space and things shifting, but I'm so grounded in the work I do. And I get pulled out of it when I feel, oh gosh, but I'm not fixing this whole system that's not working for people. And for me with a history of doing a lot of social justice work, there becomes this tension of, oh, no, I should just be doing this work for free. And I immediately go into my overgiving, especially when it comes to those types of circumstances of kind of coming up against, yeah, resistance around self-care. I mean, we don't need self-care. We need the better benefits package. Well, actually you need both, right? And I'm here in this lane. I can't solve that for you. This is my lane, right? And now that actually sounds very good saying that out loud. That feels very empowering, but it's taken a long time to get there. And that's still the trigger that pulls me back is feeling guilty for not doing this work for free for people who are in tough job situations. Well, and you, your work, when we were finishing our, like the Shocker Business Academy together, you had stepped into working with frontline workers who have, like, I think about when I worked at Family and Children's Services, I was, you know, brought in as a, as a consultant to do that work and the, the sheer need yeah. of the staff to be heard, supported and cared for was so great. Like it was, it was a very dense experience if I'm being honest, because they were feeling dense and I could sense or feel that density. So you, have you moved through a different like way in which you've been serving? Cause I can't, me personally, I, I can't imagine that going to frontline that there wouldn't be a density because it's just so many hours and so much work and not enough appreciation and not enough support. And can you share what your journey through your business has been like? I really shifted from, you know, in the beginning, I would say I, you know, I'm an empath coach for frontline workers who, you know, are learning about self-care and working through my one-liner statement and always kind of going back and editing. And because of where I was at, realizing that so much of my pull towards supporting very specifically frontline workers was from my own experience in frontline work and knowing the need for this type of support. And so I still support many organizations and many frontline organizations, but it's moved a little bit more macro of moving into, instead of just saying, well, self-care is important, let's find five minutes, right? And I can coach someone who's saying, listen, here's what my day looks like. I really don't have the capacity that maybe someone else who runs their own business can go take the hike for an hour in the afternoon on Wednesday. It's just different. It's different approaches. But I've changed my approach from less of an a, of a, oh, let's just try and find some time to, man, we deserve this. Like, yeah, like just really, it was my own growth. So I'm able to serve my clients better that it has to move beyond. Oh, let's just find time for self-care. No, let's make time for it. And we can analyze the term and we can analyze all the issues within mental health supports that aren't there. And I think a lot of it keeps us from what a lot of us want to avoid, which is prioritizing ourselves. You know, I've worked with people who truly are like, really have very little time in their schedule, but are so motivated and they're going to make that time. And there's some folks who have all the time in their schedule, but there's different barriers. It's the barrier of worthiness and there's the guilt and there's the self, like feeling selfish to work through. So that's the excitement for me is getting to work with folks across the spectrum. But I just moved back from only frontline worker to, I want to teach folks how to live authentically with really unapologetic self-care so that you can serve and do the work you love and have work-life balance that works for you. Ooh, I just felt your stardust shining all up on me, Laura. That was so Ooh. yummy. <laughs> like a fire there. I was like, hmm, that's when an empath is lit up and you can just sit there and be in their like receiving end of their magic. And you're just like, I hope everybody else felt that as well. So for you personally, then what do you do for your own like level of self-care? What are like your top five non-negotiables? Mm, okay. Non-negotiably, not on my phone in the morning. And this is one that during the pandemic has been the hardest and I've had to come back to it. I might be consistent for a couple of weeks. Then there's the morning of I turn right to the phone and the next day I try again. Right. So being really kind with myself that that's been tougher during the pandemic, but a non-negotiable of starting my day with reading the glass of water and slowly 
I spent most of my life rushing through the morning and I'm really intentional about being slow in the mornings. So that's the first non-negotiable, making sure that I fuel my body, like really good food, food that I love to eat, like nourishing and like enjoying and like plating my food and like watching an episode of Frasier while I'm eating, like doing exactly what I want. And that's what's so fun about self-care is it gets to be uniquely us. It does not have to look like anyone else's. Like I always joke about this with clients. I'm not the bath girl. I just, I won't, I don't have a deep tub. I will never be someone who really loves the bath. Like get me a spa with a hot tub. Like that's great. Um, but that's just not one of my things. Uh, another non-negotiable is <clears throat> making sure that I'm setting boundaries around time, even that's social with friends, not about supporting friends, but if someone's like, Ooh, we're having a friend zoom night, really checking in non-negotiably, what capacity do I have tonight? I'm going to join for 20 minutes or I'm not going to join tonight or yeah, sounds great. I'm really, but checking in first. So non-negotiably before any invitation comes in before I even go, yeah, yeah, yeah that's exciting. Take a moment, check in. And that's the type of self-care we will not see in a wellness magazine or on Instagram, like just checking in with yourself, right? It's not pretty, like it's right. Totally. Um, and then other non-negotiables kind of change with week to week um, with the take really good care of yourself project that I'm doing. It's truly something different each day. And that just goes along with checking in is that each day I center myself first, which has been the hardest one to do it used to be thinking about everyone else first, but now I'm able to serve everyone else because I put myself first every single day. And some days that looks like taking a half day and going skating. And the other day it looks like working at my desk all day, creating content because I'm so fired up. Right. But it, it has to be different each day. So everyone's self-care is different, but I think the checking in is the biggest non-negotiable of what do I need right now in this moment? I'm just asking, cause I'm curious now, do you meditate? I have been trying so hard <laughs> to meditate because it's like everyone's loves it. They're like, Lord, meditation is my number one self-care thing. So what I do, my version of meditation is I will put on, it won't even be like a meditation. I'll put on a podcast or something that inspires me and I will stretch because this girl can't sit still. And I know that's not a rule of meditation necessarily, but I really struggle with it. So my version of it is having I call it just my lore time where I put on like a podcast or, you know, it could be a calm app, like recording of something and I stretch and do a yoga sequence. That's my, that's version. great. I think that this is important because I talk about this a lot. Meditation looks different for everybody. Like mm -hmm. even when I'm doing courses, programs, workshops, whatever, I'm like, you know, we're going to meditate. You can sit, you can stand, you can walk around while we're doing this. You are not forced to sit in the lotus position with your eyes closed and expect that to be meditation if that's not how your yeah. body responds to yeah. stimulus like I just think it's so true there was a reason I wanted to ask that question <laughs> clearly that was supposed to come up yeah. I want to say something Frazier eh yeah <laughs> I have been okay here's the thing I am going through a whole nostalgia kick and I've been my clients have been saying the same thing that especially in the past year, it's like returning to those things you just really love. I, there's something about Frasier that just like feels like home to me. It's, it's funny. I think it's so witty. I can sit and watch Frasier. I'm the happiest woman ever. I'm just like, this is great. <laughs> I'm like, were you born in the time where Friends and Frasier was even like at its I, time? No, like later seasons. I started watching Friends when it was in season seven. And then I got the DVDs and then watched all of them like in high school. But I was just like, my sister was more the age like growing up with them. So then I'd watch, see my siblings watching them, right? So yeah, I was like, and I'm a 90s baby, but an 80s girl at heart. That's cool, yeah, because I'm like, and this is something fun that you do with your social media. And I think that this is an important conversation to have about being an empath in business too. How important is it to you that you're actually engaged and enjoying what you're doing? Do you follow a plan? Are you still checking in and only doing things that are, you know, a yes for you? Or do you get, get caught or pulled out by the expectations or what the checklist looks like and all that kind of stuff? Yeah, great question. I know that lately I'm having a bit of a, I love TikTok. Like TikTok is my jam. I love it. I'm here for it. And the reason I love it is that it's not about the aesthetic. 
And I know that there's so many folks who are like, I still have this pressure that I put on myself that Instagram has to be aesthetic. Um, you know, what? I'm a speaker. I want to do a video and I want to teach you through video. The second I have to write a caption, I'm like, Oh my God. Like, so I'm, I'm having that tension with learning how to have fun and using Instagram as a platform where I'm enjoying it. Because if I'm not enjoying it, that's going to energetically come through for my audience, my community. So where the struggle can still be is thinking, oh, I should be posting more educative content. And this is the trend I've seen on Instagram, especially within mental health and self-help has been, you know, there's therapists and coaches and people who have these beautiful pages where every post is this, you know, showstopper truth bomb and it's huge caption and all this teaching. And I look at that and go, okay, they may have the means to do this because they're, you know, a lot of their job is off of, off of online. For me, I realized that I had did, was not having strong or compassionate boundaries with myself. And I was just over giving on Instagram for the first year of my business. I was basically teaching workshops, just let me, let me teach and help you and share this and let me, oh my gosh, like, no. And it was, it was draining and it was exhausting. We see all the symptoms coming up of not being really an empowered empath and coming back into boundaries with my Instagram looks like I post what I want to post, what I feel called to post, what I think people need to hear that day. And I'm, po I'm, I'm wanting to teach through being not teach through telling like show, not tell, right. I'm creating courses. If you want to learn there, they are And my Instagram, I get to play and connect. And that's what boundaries looks like for me on there. I love that. I love that. Cause I think that, you know, we get for some of the people that I'm interviewing, well, most of them are, we're self-employed, right? And it's such an interesting thing to be a self-employed empath because of the fact that we don't have somebody who tells us these are the things you do in a day. This is like, here's your little file folder of work. Can you go and make sure that you bring this back to my desk at the end of the day? So we have the structure and the guidelines and the the plan of, okay, this is it. So like, I'm going to share, this is, this is what it looks like for me. <laughs> yes, this is my day. And when this is crossed off, I, and even if something doesn't get crossed off, I don't beat myself up about it. Yeah. By the way, for, if you're listening to the actual podcast, we have, we've held up pieces of paper, both Laura and I, that have lists of what we're doing with scratched off. And I would have to say we both write fairly large, like not average. Print. <laughs> so that what I'm doing is very bold. I'm not trying to squint to see what I'm doing. Um, but I definitely have learned over the years too, is that there is no um, guilt or shame if I don't get the list done. Yes. Yeah. We have to be our own first model right? How can we be teaching people to, you know, not beat yourself up and, and lead with kindness and compassion if with ourselves, we're like, oh my God, I didn't get this done. And then all those internal thoughts that we end up saying are things that have likely been said to us, or we've picked up on from family of origin and community and society and everything. So we like, how cool is that, that we get to stop that? Like we get to do something different. How freaking awesome is that? Like we can say, nope, that's not working for me. Have you, have you read my third book, The Blind Leap? It's okay if you haven't. I haven't, no. Because the way that I define it is, is we're the CEO and the first employee. Mm. And how the CEO speaks to the first employee sets the company culture. Ah, uh, nice. And yeah. so if you as the CEO are shitting on your, your employees and saying that they're terrible and they're not getting their work done and that they're worthless employees and all those kinds of things, who's going to want to come in, into your... <laughs> office and, and hire you as a coach, <laughs> right? So we, as a CEO and first employee, that's so, so mm. important that we have a really strong culture of, of compassion and love and care. Wow. I love that. So I'm going to ask, because I'm curious, <laughs> I'm always just, the funniest <laughs> part about being a podcast, <laughs> always just like, yeah. ask whatever I want. Yeah. And because you and I haven't talked in a long time. True. I get to ask questions that I simply just want to know the answer to. <laughs> Relationships and being an empath, because mm -hmm. I know <laughs> the last time I spoke with you, um, things were up in the air between you and your partner. And, you know, how did you navigate through that as an empath and build a strong relationship to where you are? 
I mean, it, it really comes back to boundaries too. I mean, you have to look at, it's so easy to, in relationships as an empath, to either not express your needs clearly and expect that someone thinks about things the same way as you, you know, gives energy and gives support in the same way that you do. And I think that's the first lesson within relationships, whether it's romantic, whether it's friendship or familial, it's okay. The way that I give is not necessarily going to be the way that that person gives. And first of all, is that going to work for me? Or is that a deal breaker? Right? Like that's the first question people just need to ask for themselves is like, I can't be expecting that someone is just going to know my needs, even though I can perceive what someone needs even before they do, or I can perceive, Oh, you had a tough day. Oh, it was actually okay. Five minutes later. Mm -hmm, there it was. Right. Yeah. But we can't expect that someone else is going to do that. So for me, the biggest lesson within my relationship has been, I need to a know my needs for myself, b express those. And if I'm needing something, I need to ask for it. Right. And then there's an opportunity for the other person to then engage in their own work of building up how they support us. And it has to begin, it has to be co-created. Mm -hmm. But I think a lot of times I look at the history of all my relationships, it became this tension between me expecting the other person to have the same level of empathy and the exact same, you know, approach to things. And inevitably it's just, it, that's just not going to work. So it comes back down to, we have needs and they deserve to be met in a relationship. And if we go into it thinking, no, 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 like I'm the giver. I like doing all these things, but you're not being honest about what you really want. That's going to come up a year later, two years, five years, 10 years later. Totally. So I think that's the biggest, you know, expressing your needs, but also realizing how do I want to be loved? Not just, oh, here's how I love. Cause I think every empath knows the type of role, right? We know how we love. We can, we got the love languages. We got our, you know, attachment theory. We've done that work. Oh my God. I have done all of those quizzes. <laughs> right? Yes. For love. Yes. Yes. <laughs> I've been seeing so many people talking about new dating right now being like, all right, I need the receipts. Are you going to therapy? Do you have your attached? What are your attached <laughs> wounds? Like, what's your Myers Briggs? Let's just hammer this out. So, yeah. What is your level <laughs> of self development? Do you believe that you have to be continuously working on yourself to be in a relationship? Like these right. kind of questions. I think one of the things that I recognize, having gotten to a place in my marriage where we were not um, healthy with each other at that time, was and it had a lot to do with self-development was that we were existing in pre in pre-existed patterns of our previous selves, even though we had done the work. So we had actually started the self-development path, both of us, but yet because we connected at a time where we were very deeply embedded into these previous versions of ourselves, we were still kind of caught in this rut of of it that just was and it would be like I don't know if we can because I kept saying we can figure this out while we're still together I'm sure we could do this if, while we're still together but the rut was so deep I was like we can't do this together <laughs> we can't there has to be a separation mm -hmm. to break like almost like to put a stick in the wheel to stop it from spinning and doing the same pattern over and over again to disrupt mm -hmm. the path yeah but for me I can tell you right now everybody listening one of the things of self-realization I've had as an empath, I need alone time. Mm, yep. I need alone time to flush. Right. Yeah. The emotions of others, the do my core cutting, do my like thing that I need to do in order to cleanse my energy. And I think that as empaths, if we feel that people want us, we're like, I'll be there for you. Uh, like, I'll be with you all the time, all the time, all the time, all the time, all the time. No, no. Yeah. And we have to investigate where that pattern comes from, right? Because all of us empath or not, will repeat the same patterns until we're ready to change them. And they will continue to show up in new people, in new jobs, in new circumstances. I can trace my overgiving through even like all the different pieces of my life. And in my head thinking, oh, I've made this huge change. And you can, we can be doing, like you're saying, you can do the self-development work. You can be doing that. And there's always that deeper layer that sometimes there has to be a really specific change in order to flip the pattern on its head. It's yeah. I don't know if I'm allowed to ask this question because you and your partner took a little break too, at some point. Early on. Yeah. Early on. Yeah. Yeah. 
Was and that to do that same kind of thing or? Yeah, I think it had to be kind of a realization of, you know, and, and I had at the time that I had met my partner, we were at, I had just gone to your retreat. Like it was so early on that I had just kind of, my mind was like opening up. Oh my God, I am an empath. Oh my God, I'm going to run my own business. I'm, I'm making these huge changes. <laughs> Whoa, like all these things. That's the effect and, of hanging out with me. <laughs> right. <laughs> And then trying to like co-create a relationship where it was, you know, I had my old pattern and my new patterns at the same time is the yeah. best way I can describe it. So there was this push pull of almost each day, moment to moment. It was like Laura's in her, like, what would the hundred K coach Laura do? Which was like the question you'd ask me, right. Of like, I'm, I'm manifesting, I'm in abundance. And then I'd be back in fear. What do people think? Play small. Don't express your needs. Like you don't need much out of a relationship. Like all those things would. So I was really doing two lanes at once and needed to step back and be in my own lane before I could enter back into, again, certain friendships, relationship, next stage of my business. It had to have that separation because the patterns were that deep. I think that that's such a powerful way to define it is like you had your new patterns and your old patterns and they were just like, like shifting. It was like push pull mm -hmm. in. Yeah. Cause again, when we're even talking about neurological pathways, the brain will automatically go back to its old, like landing site, receptor site automatically. We have to embed something new over and over and over again to change the actual path of a neuron in your brain to form the new habit. And when we're in things oftentimes, and this is, I just did a video today talking about that, like removing yourself from a traumatic abusive situation, no matter where it is in any form or any way, is, is you should feel zero guilt or shame about that because doing self-healing requires you putting yourself first, right? That's that self-care. And that looks like, you know, you have to be willing to, to remove yourself oftentimes uncomfortably from situations, relationships, mm -hmm. family ties, <laughs> clients, yeah. mentors, mm -hmm. ever. Because even in a client mentor relationship, and I'm going to use this because I'm going to come to you and ask you about what the word codependency looks like to you in a second. But even we as empaths can absorb or believe we have to be what our mentors want us to be and not who we actually are as well. Mm -hmm. So can you talk about codependency and then play kind of like how that has played a role in your empath journey? For sure. The, for me, what it comes down to with codependency is this belief that I have to, this pull towards shifting and changing even my values for, to it be in line with someone else. Like it go, it went so deep thinking back to when I was a child, it was a survival mm -hmm. technique. It was, mm -hmm. oh, like this will get me love, acceptance, safety, uh, safety was huge. So codependency got born out of and this is where it just, it connects so much with being able to read the room, which is a skill that I own as an empath, but as a child was, I know the second something's up in the way that the door was opened. So that kind of on edgeness, even within my codependency became, what do I, I self-betraying in order to, you know, continue a relationship, continue a client interaction, putting my prices down, like all these decisions to basically shift who I was in order to be accepted in order to, you know, please someone. And there's just such, I'm just picked up two books on codependency and kind of deepening my own understanding of it, you know, using the term so much in therapy, but still learning really, what does that look like for me as I'm moving through it and stepping outside of it? Even when it came to business, this belief that I think especially for coaches, people who run their own businesses, they're entrepreneur, that we see so many examples of it and we work with different coaches and then it has to look the same way. And that was where that line, when I took your quiz of, you know, I, I help manifest change one person at a time that I realized like that's the medicine. And I was beating myself up for not running my business, say how you were, how another coach was, you know, someone else in a group I'd once attended thinking, oh, well, that's the right way to do it. When oh, I've got to change and shift and do that. And again, it's that loss of sense of self. At the end of the day, people who navigate codependency really have a, not only like a low self-worth, but a loss of self, which you combine that with being an empath. No wonder there's this unboundaried, I'm going to find my identity and how much I help others. Mm -hmm. 
Mm-hmm. And so the connections between that lately have just been like truth bombs going off in my head of, oh, like, because I've gotten to the stage of being able to see it with compassion and not judge myself for it and learn from it. Whereas two years ago, it have been like, oh, no, that's not me. No, 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 no. I'm an empath. Yay. And that was it. And that was the end of conversation. <laughs> no sh- shadow work. No, no, no. <laughs> like, we're not going to get into that. So it's, you know, it's exciting to get to a stage where we can offer ourselves compassion to truly see who we are and get to create who we are. I always think, um, you know, we're, when we start our spiritual journey and we get to the place of spiritual awakening or realization and we're like, yay, I'm awakened. Woo-hoo-hoo! And then you're like, fuck, what yeah. the hell? I can't get off this ride. And like, it's like, it's the deepest, most intense experience, but it's the most profoundly self-acquiring right for me being having moved out west and um a new emotion for me is grief Mm. like i i I knew of grief i understood there was something called grief (laughs) oh yeah it's an on that emotion sheet that you can look up there's like a sad thing or something but to experience it to such a depth to Mm -hmm. form a new relationship with it has been oh horrible and wonderful (laughs) right like I think everything from the self journey is both profoundly uncomfortable and some would say terrible but yet offers the most beauty Mm -hmm. and like love yeah. At the same time. So, and this yeah. past year has been super charged. Like, and I'm thinking for you, like making this, this huge move, like, you know, and, and feeling deep grief during a time that collectively we're feeling deep grief, which empaths were like, well, I'm feeling all of everyone else's and mine. And that's where, you know, boundaries around news. Like I'm like Twitter, no, thank you. I'm gone. Like yeah. it does like as empaths, that's what boundaries aren't always going to be with a person. Like think about like, those are do it today. Boundaries is what I call it with my clients. Like these are low vulnerability ones, whereas boundaries with a family member, maybe a higher vulnerability one, that's going to take some energetic healing and some work and some really, you know, practice around how it's going to sound. And then there's your do it today, which is delete Twitter off your phone. Done. Yeah. Somebody yes. puts you on your social media or gives you a no feeling, just take them off your social media. We, even that is a boundary that we aren't taught, right? Like we would sit there and be uncomfortable in our own spaces in our own social media in our own, uh, whether it's TikTok or Instagram or, or Facebook and allow other people to come into our space and demand how we feel. Mm. And it's like, you can start there. That's a great boundary place to be like, yeah. you don't make me feel good. You don't make me feel good. Mm. And then and I know this because I went through this and I'm, I'm going to tell you guys, you'll go like, I can't just kick people out of my social media. Like, what if they find out? What if they know they'll be upset with me? Why is their feeling more important than your health? <laughs> right? Ding, like, ding, ding. Yes. Right? Like we have to get to a place where even if you're because we're talking about self-care, the self-care of just claiming your own social media as a start point and then expanding. And expanding. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. It's all about practice. Like I use, I use so many sports metaphors. I don't even play that many sports, but I always like a good sports metaphor. And it's like, if we think of like stretching and like learning something new or take yoga, like you're not going to get the pose the first time you do tree pose it's like, we got to practice. And so with boundaries, I think a lot of us quit before we're ahead and we'll say, oh, well, that's uncomfortable, right? We've got to sit with the discomfort. People ask me, how do you set boundaries and not feel guilty? And I say, you won't. You do feel guilty. guilty. Yeah. <laughs> and they go, they just look at me deer in the headlights. And I'm like, guilt is an emotion. It's not neither good, nor bad. It's just an emotion. It's giving you information. You're going to feel real guilty. Oh, you're setting a boundary with your mom you're going to feel so guilty. It'll be so uncomfortable. And they're like, how is this supposed to help me? And I'm, I'm like, I'm no, like no bullshit. Like I'm not going to sit here and say that boundaries are a piece of cake because that's dishonest. They're really tough for empaths and they get easier the more we practice them. And it becomes a habit. It becomes, Oh, I did that. Oh, didn't even feel guilty. 
mm-hmm. other times it will make us want to lie in bed all day. And then we will, and we'll heal the grief and we'll support the grief versus changing the boundary. Yeah. That's a beautiful place to kind of close a little bit here. And I know, cause I could talk to you. I we were just like having a great old conversation. <laughs> Let's just keep going and going and going. So I love to ask this final question because I like the community called rebel unicorns. Mm-hmm. And so I'm going to ask, what does being a rebel unicorn mean to you? Mm. For me, it means choosing myself every day, even if it makes other people uncomfortable, angry, upset, any different emotion. To be a like rebel unicorn means choosing myself without apology. <clears throat> you know, being an empath is so helpful, you guys, when I'm putting people in, slotting them in as who my guest is going to be and what the topic is, because I already know. <laughs> conversation gonna be kind of like and so that's why I was like we're gonna have self-care and the importance of self-care as empaths with Laura and I mean I don't have to script it I don't need to tell you that I just know that and this is part of the gift of being an empath you can know these really significant powerful things such as I know Laura's gonna just say that thing she's gonna be exactly who the right person is for this experience and uh to support you guys in hearing how important self-care is and Laura if they're like oh man she is like a self to my soul I absolutely need to to speak with her where would they go and find you my Instagram is at self-care with Laura and that's the best place to send me a DM and then check out the link in my bio where you can find some courses and sign up for my newsletter and I send you some goodies every week for your self-care journey I love and adore you I love and adore you. Thank you so much for having me on. Oh, I it just felt so good to see you again. Oh, <laughs> I just, oh nice. as soon as like I was like a little kid who was like, you know, when you're in, in grade school and you go all summer before seeing your friends again and you get to the first day of school and you're just like, oh my God, how was your summer? <laughs> like that was the sensation when I saw you today. It was so amazing. I'm so grateful that you came in and shared your stardust, your magic, your light, your mission, your service with this community. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. You are amazing. Thank you so much. Wow. That episode was mind blowing. I hope you had as many ahas listening to it as I had recording it. I would love to see the Rebel Unicorns podcast spread far and wide across the globe, across the universe. So if you want to share it on your social media with something that you found impactful, leave a review, send it to a friend. It would be ah, so deeply appreciated. Also a little side note, I did recently change my name. I downloaded a year and a half ago that my name was Avalon Starlight. It was previously my birth name was Tamara Arnold. And if you're interested in learning what your rebel unicorn house is, oh yeah, there's a quiz for that. Think Harry Potter, except you're sorted into how you are impacting the world with your stardust and what energy you're here to shift and change. You can find out your rebel unicorn house at www dot tamara arnold dot ca slash quiz let me know tag me in social media send the quiz out and join the rebel unicorns facebook group to be in a community of like-minded spiritual entrepreneurs who understand that when you shift your energy you transform your business